Sunday. Fun day. I'm super psyched. It's Sunday. Right now? Hey, thanks for joining us. Today is going to be fun. We are grateful that you welcomed us into your homes. We have a great Sunday plan for you to engage your heart and mind. We're gonna celebrate communion together, so go grab whatever elements you've got, potato chips, juice, crackers. We're gonna remember that Christ died for our sins together, and we wanna connect with you. And so if you have a cell phone, grab it and text the word connections to 97,000, 97,000 connections, because we wanna know how to pray for you. We wanna know how to come alongside you. If there are ways we can serve you, maybe you're new to Faith Church and we don't know who you are yet, but we wanna welcome you to our family. Text us, would you? And we're always grateful that you give. Here are the options for you, the ways for you, could, for you to give to Faith Church. Again, great Sunday to be together. Will you pray with me? God, we welcome you into our homes, into our hearts right now. As we lean in to sing and worship you, as we learn about you and celebrate the Lord's Supper together, please be with us now. Speak to us. We're listening. In Christ's name, amen. Open the gates of heaven, lift 
darkness shout of praise There is a light in warfare Jesus the King of glory There is a light in warfare Jesus the King of glory Sing a new song today. It's called We Praise You. So let's come before Him. Let's give Him the praise that He is due. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise. Yeah. 
Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, always my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, always my song. Cause you are good. You're good. Oh, 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 and let the king of my heart. The king of my heart Be the fire inside my veins The echo of my days Always my song Let the king of my heart Be the wind inside my sails The echo in the waves Always my song And let the king of my heart emotions do not dictate your character you are the same yesterday today and forever the other thing our feelings can't dictate is how you love us God you love us so so much 
you chase after us. You run right into our mess. You're like a dad whose kid, maybe they spilled milk. You run right into the mess, God, because you are so good and you are so full of love. You are love and your love transforms. We thank you so much. Open our hearts today to hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen. It's been amazing worshiping with you guys. The more I read, the more I studied it, the longer I just sat there and listened, the more I started to realize who actually needed to hear these words. See, I, I'm a Bible teacher. It's just in my bones. It's what I love to do. I see the Bible and I see the stories and the, the characters and how it all fits together. And I love sharing that. And I love giving people hope through that and inspiring people and pointing people to God through his word. But this passage, these words, I realized that this week they're not just for you, they're for me. My son, he's five years old, he teaches me a lot of life lessons. The other day I was walking down the hall and I peeked into his room and he was just sitting there on the floor playing, playing with some cars I think, and I just kind of knocked on the door and poked my head in and I said, hey, hey son, I love you. And he had the best response. He just turns around and he goes, yeah, I know, you already told me that. And I just had to laugh at it. And I just said to him, yeah, but I don't want you to forget. There's something about this passage that we're going to look at today, about these words, where I just felt like God was saying, Brad, I don't want you to forget. See, there's a lot of passages I come to in the Bible, and I read them, and I, I go, kind of like my son, I read them, and I go, yeah, I, I already know that. I've read that a thousand times. What else you got? But with this passage, it was like God was saying, no, I need you to stop. I need you to just be still. I need you to really listen because I don't want you to forget. And lately there have been some of these things that maybe I've been forgetting. So we're going to do something a little bit different today. I'm going to preach to me. And along the way, I'm going to preach to you also, but I'm going to preach this to myself because there are some basic truths that I need to hear, that I've been forgetting about lately, that I need to be reminded of. I need to hear God say, you know, Brad, I actually do really love you. You know, Brad, those thoughts that are going through your mind that play on a loop all day long over and over and over again, maybe some of those actually aren't true. You know, Brad, you're more than the things that you've done. You're more than your sin. You're more than the way that you've disappointed people. Brad, you're more than your job. I need to hear that. Brad, you're more than the, the likes or the comments or the views that you get. Brad, you're, you're more than your bank account. See, I know what God says about me. I, I, I can see it in the Bible, but a lot of times those other voices, they start to get pretty loud. And so today I'm going to preach to me. And hopefully you'll get something out of it along the way as well. But I need to hear these things. I need to make sure I don't forget these things that God has said. So if you have a Bible, you're going to want it today. We're going to be in the book of Ephesians. We're jumping into a brand new series. And I love the book of Ephesians. When I read the book of Ephesians, I read about the city of Ephesus. I think more than any other place that I read about in the Bible, and more than any other time, I read it and I go, man, these guys are a lot like us. This culture, their world, their city, it just sounds a lot like the times and the places that we're living in. See, if I say to you, a city in Turkey in the first century, 
you're not going to picture what Ephesus was really like. This place was hyper-advanced. Just the architecture alone would have blown you away. On one end of the city, they had built a giant sports arena, a big stadium. On the other end of the city, they had this massive outdoor shopping mall. In between, there was fine dining. There were health spas where you could go and relax. In the center of the city, they had built this beautiful outdoor theater. It overlooked the bay. You could see the sun come down. This theater sat 20,000 people. How do you build that with hand tools? Just outside the city, just at the north end of town, was the crown jewel, a temple. A temple built for the Greek goddess Artemis. She's the daughter of Zeus. And it wasn't just a temple, it was also the World Bank. It was where people brought all their wealth. This place was longer than a football field. It was six stories tall. People brought their money, they brought their artwork, their family heirlooms to store them there. The city of Ephesus had the latest medical advancements. It had the coolest tech. The most brilliant minds in the world, they wanted to study and teach in this place. Ephesus is a place that you'd want to live. I'd want to live full of advancements, full of cool things. It was a place that you could get sucked into it all, wrapped up in all the excitement and all the energy and all the new technology. It was a place where you could be defined by having the latest and greatest. A place that you would be defined by your accomplishments, your achievements. And so hyper-advanced city, yes, but when the Apostle Paul writes to the church, to his friends in Ephesus, he says, come back, come back to the basics. Let me remind you of the basics. I know you've heard it before. I know you're super advanced, you're, you're wealthy, you're accomplished. I get it. But you need to hear the basics. Come back. Let me remind you of these most basic truths that God has said. And so that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to preach some of these basic truths, honestly to myself, because I really need to hear them. And again, hopefully along the way, there's something in here for you as well. If you're anything like me, you might need to be reminded of these things as well. So here's what Paul says. Oh, and let me warn you, Paul, super wordy, okay? This stuff, it gets a little thick. So stick with me. Ephesians 1, starting in verse 3. Here's what he says. He says, Praise be to God and Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and to be blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will and to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of our sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace, which he has lavished upon us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mysteries of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Okay, take a deep breath. That's a lot. And we're about halfway done. So funny story, because we need a funny story, because that was really heavy. So funny story about Paul in Ephesus. So Paul, about 10 years before he writes this letter, he's in the city of Ephesus, and one night he's preaching to a bunch of people, and they're in someone's house, and they're actually like hanging out in their living room. They're up on the third floor of their house, and Paul is preaching, and he's teaching the gospel. He's talking to these guys, and one young man is kind of leaning on the wall, And he's just kind of listening to Paul. And Paul goes on for so long that the guy actually falls asleep and he falls out the window of the third floor and he dies. 
Now listen, I mean, I know it and you know it. I've preached some stinkers, but I've never actually bored anyone to death, right? But that's what Paul does. And the best part of the story is Paul actually goes down and he brings the guy back to life. In the name of Jesus, come back to life. He brings him back to life and he goes back upstairs and he starts preaching again. Like, read the room, man. I love that story. Okay, back to Ephesians 1. It's going to get even heavier for just a minute. But stick with me, because then we'll take, a, we'll take a deep dive together. Verse 11. It says, In him, in Christ, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. Also, you are included in Christ. When you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Wow. Like, if you need to, stand up, stretch your legs, you know, stretch out a little bit. My man Paul loves a good run-on sentence. So, I don't want to read it again, but I went through and I made a list of everything that God says about us. Paul is speaking to the people in Ephesus, but he says that this is for all Christ followers. These are the things that are true about all of God's people. Here's what God says about us. And I'm, I'm preaching it to me, so I'm going to say, here's what God says about me. He says that I'm, I'm blessed, meaning I have God's favor, that I'm chosen before the foundation of the world that God chose me, that he sees me as holy, as blameless, that he's predestined my path, that he adopted me into his family, that God calls me his son that he's given me everything that he has, even Jesus. He calls me redeemed, the word redeemed there. In Ephesus, they had the largest slave trade in the world at the time, and that word redeemed was the word for buying someone out of slavery. God has bought me out of slavery. He has paid a price for me. He says that I'm forgiven. He says he gives me good things, good gifts that he tells me all his secrets, that God is not far off, disinterested, preoccupied, that he keeps secrets. No, he shares his will with us. He says he sealed my eternity by giving me the Holy Spirit. And he says a second time, I chose you. I marked out your path. And there are days where I read this, a passage like this, and I go, yeah, God, yeah, Dad, like my son. Yeah, Dad, I know you've told me before. I've heard it. And then there are days like today, like days recently where, oh, I need to hear this. This is exactly what I need to hear. What do you hear? As I read that list to you, what do you hear? What stands out to you? I mean, you can let it just kind of go over your head. You can kind of let it just pass by. But if you let it sit in your heart for a minute, what do you hear? That God has called you a part of his family? That God says he places his favor on you? That God says he marks out your path? That he's given you his, his Holy Spirit? What do you hear? Let me give you a couple things that jump off the page for me that I hear. One, he says that I'm completely forgiven. Maybe this happens to you. I don't know. Lately, I've had this thing where stuff will come into my head that I did five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And honestly, like immediately, I'm embarrassed by those things. And I feel shame. And it's like, I can't go back and undo that stuff. I can't unwrite that story. And so all I'm left with is, is this sense of shame, this sense of embarrassment. But God calls me completely 
forgiven. He says that because of Jesus Christ, I will never have to answer for those things. That someday I will stand before God like we all will. I'll stand before God and I'll bow before him. Yeah, I will because he's God, but I won't have to hang my head in shame because of Jesus Christ. I'm forgiven of those things, all of it. Paul writes in in Romans 8, he says, therefore, there is now no condemnation. None, not even a little bit. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. He says in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The old doesn't even exist anymore. Get that out of here. A new creation. The new is here. Amazing to me that God gives us this kind of freedom, that I don't have to be consumed with regret and shame. There is no condemnation because of Jesus Christ. And I know for many of you, you've heard this before, but I need you to hear it right now. Not with your head, my friend, but I need you to hear it in your heart. That thing that you did years ago or last week or just this morning. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you know what happens? When we can really let this sink in, we can really get this, you know what happens is the things that once brought us shame, those things now bring me joy. Not because I'm proud of my sin, not because I go, oh, I got away with it. No, no, no. But because God loves me that much, because God knows everything I've done, everything I've said, everything that I've thought, the way that I've treated people, He knows it all. Everything that's been done to me. And He says, you, Brad, you are a new creation. The old is gone. The new is here. You'll notice this this phrase, Just as a little primer to this whole series, you'll notice this phrase in Ephesians a lot. It's this phrase, in Christ or or in Him. Paul uses this phrase about 27 times. He repeats this, in Christ, this phrase. He's, He's calling us up to something. He's identifying us as being one in Jesus Christ. Jesus says, just as I and the Father are one, I want to be with you and you in me. He's identifying us as followers of Christ, that we are in Christ. So here's the deal. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, the truth is the the peace, the hope, the forgiveness that I'm talking about, you're not going to feel that. You're not going to find that. But you can. The Bible says that you can have a relationship with Christ. You can be brought into a relationship where you are in Christ. And it says it's this simple. By believing that Jesus Christ died on a cross for your sins, And then he rose from the dead to give you eternal life. I know some of you might go, this is so basic. I know. But what are you hearing? Again, go back to that list. What are you feeling? What jumps out to you? That you're forgiven? That you're redeemed? Something else that Paul says that really sticks out with me. He says this. He says that I'm chosen. And this is one where I have to fight it a little bit because I immediately think, start thinking of all the theological implications. And, and I have to go, no, 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 Brad, could you just listen? Could you just listen to what the Bible says? Just listen to what God is telling you. Verse 4, and again in verse 11, he says that you are chosen before the foundation of the world. So, so, so get this. Before Genesis 1, Before the beginning, God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, they're together, and it's perfect, and they're on the throne, and it's unapproachable light, it's thunder, and it's lightning, and it's incredible. And they're talking, and and they go, you know what we, you know what I want to do? I want to make this guy Brad, and I want to give him life. And I want to give him hope and peace. And you know what else? I want to spend eternity with him. But, you know, he's 
Honestly, he's, he's pretty broken. He's pretty damaged. So, so I got it. So Jesus, you're going to actually go down there. And this Brad guy, you're going to die for him to allow us to forgive his sins, to pay for his brokenness. And Jesus goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll do that. And of course, I'm just sort of imagining this. I'm sort of making this up. But, but you get the point. Somehow, and for some reason, the God of creation wants to spend eternity with me and with you. And he'll do anything and everything that he has to do to make that happen. I so wish I could understand this. Because I look in the mirror and I see failure and I see fear and honestly I see pride. I mean, if quarantine has proven anything, it's that no one should want to spend eternity with me, okay? But God does. He says that he chose me and you before the foundation of the world. And listen, before you get all bent out of shape theologically, and I get it, you're already like typing up the email to send me. Please don't, okay? Can we just settle it this way for now? That somehow, for some reason, God, before the foundation of the world, somehow in love chose us. Somehow in love says predestined us to be with him. I don't know how it works, okay? And honestly, neither do you. And we're going to get to heaven someday, and we can fight with Paul and go, man, what were you talking about there? What were you trying to say? But what God chooses to do, everything that God chooses to do, he chooses to do it in, in love. I also believe that the other side of that is true, that God gives us choices. He didn't make us robots. And so in love, he gives us choices. And so he calls us to respond to that love, to respond to him. But here's what I do know, because it's what the Bible says, not my words, God's words, that before the foundation of the world, God decided that he wanted to give you and me life. And he decided that he would do anything and everything that he needed to do to accomplish that. So that he could call us his sons and his daughters, his beloved, his redeemed, forgiven. So that he could spend eternity with us. And because of Jesus, he doesn't look at us and see failure and sin and shame and disappointment. He looks at you and he sees, well, he sees love. So... I don't know, what are you hearing? What's standing out to you? What are you feeling in, in this list of things that God says? You could easily go, yeah, I've heard it before. Okay, listen to the message, I've heard that one before. You could do that, but if just for a minute you let this actually penetrate your heart, you let God's word actually seek, sink in a little bit, what are you hearing? What are you feeling? Maybe it's old hat to you, fine, but I don't know. Maybe it's all too basic, but, but what is it that you're hearing? Imagine that you lived in Ephesus. Imagine you're, you're a citizen of Ephesus, this cool place. You have this temple where you go and you worship the Greek goddess Artemis. She is all-powerful. She is the god of hunting, of nature, and of fertility. So imagine you go out one day hunting. You've got to get some food for your family, and... You don't get anything. You come back empty-handed. Okay, it's one day. You go out the next day. You go hunting to get food. You come back empty-handed. Imagine this goes on for a few days, and now you're looking at your kids across the table, and they don't have anything to eat, and they're starving. And the only answer is, well, you must have done something to tick Artemis off. Imagine you're a fisherman, and you send your, your crew out to go fishing, you, you load up the boat and you send them out. And imagine there's a storm and they all drown at sea. And the only explanation is that you didn't give Artemis enough. Imagine that you want to start a family. You get married, you want to have some kids, but you can't have kids. Everybody around you, all your friends, they're having kids, but you can't. And the only explanation is, well, Artemis was preoccupied. Artemis gave all her blessing away to someone else. So that, so that they could have kids. And the entire message is, do more. Work harder. Try more. 
And then Paul writes, and he reminds you of this God who says, I love you. You have my favor. When I look at you, I don't see shame and sin. I see grace. I see the face of Jesus Christ. I see love. I see redemption. I see hope. I see this story that's being written. I see someone that I want to spend eternity with. Why does he do this? I mean, lest we think this is all about us and we're just so awesome. No, the Bible's about God. Why does he do this? It says in verse 6, in verse 12, in verse 14, circle it. He tells us why. It says, to the praise of God's glory. God does this all so that we would praise him, so that we would worship him. And he doesn't force us. He doesn't demand that we love him. Like, I can't make my son love me. God doesn't demand that wouldn't be love. He offers us grace and forgiveness and he hopes that in love back, in praise and in worship back that we would worship him, that we would praise him for it. That's what all the redemption, the forgiveness, the adoption is for. Simply that we would worship him and praise him. I don't know. Maybe it's all too basic. I've been following Jesus for a long time, not as long as some of you, but for a long time. Maybe I should be more enlightened than this. Maybe I should be able to move on to bigger and better things, but there's something about this I need to hear. I need to be reminded. I need God. I need to hear God say, Brad, you're more than a sinner. You're more than the thoughts that are swirling around in your head. You're more than the frustrations you've had during this whole COVID mess. Brad, I don't look at you and see the dumb things that you did when you were 15 or 25 or 35 or even last week or yesterday. I don't see those things. I see grace. I see love. You're more than that. You're mine. So let me ask you the question that I've been asking myself. Why do you treat yourself like that? I mean, do you hear the things that you're saying to yourself? Do you know who you are? God calls you his daughter, his son. I'm a parent. If anyone talked to one of my children the way you talk to yourself, I wouldn't stand for it. My friends, some of us, we got to stop beating ourselves up. We got to stop talking like this to ourselves. We've got to stop letting our failures creep back in again and again and again. You're continually beating yourself up for things that you did years ago. Things that Jesus Christ already died for. I mean, what, what happened to no condemnation in Christ? Every time I let those thoughts come back in and they beat me down and I hold on, I pick up that shame and hold on to it again, it's like I'm saying, no, God, I don't really believe in that. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. You are a new creation. The old is, it's gone. It doesn't even exist anymore. The new is here. There is no condemnation for those in Christ. Do you believe those words? Why are you beating yourself up? Why are you listening to what other people say who don't even know you? This God who knows everything about you, he says you're chosen. He says you're loved. He says you're part of his family. You're redeemed. You're bought away from all of that. You're forgiven of your sin that you are marked. You carry that mark of Jesus Christ in His Holy Spirit. The labels of failure, of sin, and sinner, of broken, of damaged, of worthless, you shouldn't be carrying those daughter, son of God. Because of Jesus, when He looks at you, God sees holy and blameless. He sees His child, His beloved, to the praise of his glory. Over the next number of weeks, as we continue to journey through Ephesians, we're going to talk about how this plays out. What does all this mean? How does it impact our relationships? But here's my challenge for you today, right now. 
Stop being so hard on yourself. God's not. Stop being so hard on yourself. And so that you don't think this is some kind of self-help message, it's not. Ask God, ask the Holy Spirit of God to help you, to walk with you, to help you live today like someone who actually has freedom, who's fully forgiven, to help you have the hope of someone who's been redeemed, to have the grace of someone who's been chosen, the faith of someone who's been adopted, the love of someone who God has said, you're mine. So you can label all, yourself all the things that you want. You can give yourself all the names that you want to give yourself, but the only label that really matters is this. Are you ready for it? It's love. Would you pray with me? God, there are some of us right now, right now, God, who we have been feeling beat up, we have been feeling like we're broken, like we're damaged. God, there are people right now that are hearing my voice, but God, I'm asking you in the power of your Holy Spirit, let the, your words sink in. God, we feel broken, we feel damaged, but you call us chosen, loved, redeemed, forgiven. You call us your sons and your daughters. We're not those labels that we give to ourselves. We're loved by the King, by the God of creation, who chose us before the foundations of the world to be with Him. God, help us know all of that, all of what that means. It's hard to even get our minds around. Some of us, God, we've been walking with you for years, and it's in one ear and out the other. God, help this to land in our, in our hearts and our minds today, that we are in Christ, that we are these things. We are not the labels that we give ourselves. God, help us to see how good you really must be, that you would know all these things about me, the worst things about us, the most impure thoughts we've ever had, the things that we've done, the way we've talked to people, God, the embarrassing things that have been done to us. You know it all. And you don't label us by any of those things. You call us loved. You call us chosen. You call us your sons and your daughters. God, help us to know what that really means so that we would praise you more, so that we would give you all the glory so that we would say, man, if God knows everything that I've done and still forgives me, he must be a great God. Father, thanks that you paid the price of your son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us. God, even now, help us to not be caught up in the thoughts that run through our minds, the fears that we have. The ways, the ways that we measure ourselves by our accomplishment or our wealth or anything else, just like these people in Ephesus, God, remind us of the basics, that you love us, that you've chosen us, that you've called us your own. It's through the redeeming, powerful name of Christ I pray. Amen. Precious blood has left me forgiven Pure like the whitest of snow Powerful to make sin and shame retreat This covenant is making me whole So I will For by His mercy my life was spared The highest man has set me free Because
eyes of Jesus, my heart is clean. Purify my heart in your presence. Teach me to discover the joy of holiness that forms as you draw me close. In you what was lost is restored. So I will. By his mercy, my life was spared. The highest name has set me free. Because of Jesus, my heart is clean. So I will rise and lift my head. For by his mercy, my life was spared The highest man has set me free Because of Jesus, my heart is clean Because of Jesus, my heart is clean My name is Paul Miners, and I have the awesome privilege of serving on the pastoral team here at Faith Church. And this morning, I get to do something that I love to do, and that is to gather us around, figuratively speaking, of course, to gather us around the communion table for the observance of the Lord's Supper. Pastor Brad shared a personal moment with us this morning when he said to his five-year-old son that he loved him. And his son said, I know you love me. Why do you keep telling me? And Brad responded, because I do not want you to forget that I love you. And our Heavenly Father doesn't want us to forget that he loves us. And our Savior, Jesus Christ, doesn't want us to forget that he loves us. But Jesus knew us. He knows us. He knows that we are often distracted, that we're consumed by life's challenges, that we lose focus, that we're caught up with other things. And so, on the night he was betrayed, the night before his crucifixion, he met with the disciples in the upper room they were there to eat the Passover meal. And during that meal, Jesus introduced something, something very simple and yet deeply meaningful that we might refer to as a ritual of remembrance, which we have come to know as the Lord's Supper or communion. And every time we observe communion, we are reminded, we remember, that Jesus loves us, that he loved us enough to die for us. And every time we observe communion, we are reminded of who we are in Christ. As Pastor Brad shared this morning, we are forgiven. We have been declared holy. We are blameless. We are redeemed. We have been adopted into the family of God with all the rights and privileges that that brings. And we have been given the Holy Spirit who lives in us and with us now, but is also the guarantee that all of the promises of God will be kept by Him. So this morning, it's our privilege to once again remember what Jesus has done for us. The instructions for this moment were passed on to the Apostle Paul, and he records them in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, 
This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And when we do this, we proclaim what Christ has done for us, what it means for us, to ourselves, to each other as we encourage one another, and to the world as well. Jesus goes, or Paul goes on to say that before we take, we ought to examine ourselves. So this is a good moment. We need to come to this moment with clean hands and a pure heart to examine our heart, to see if there's some sin we need to confess. Because this is a moment when we can do that. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It's also a time maybe for some who are hearing me right now who have never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this very moment, you can confess your need and invite the Lord Jesus to be part of your life. So I remind you this morning that when we take the bread, it's a symbol of the body of Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, in a point of time, became incarnate. He took on a body that he might identify with us and become our Savior. And when we take the cup, it represents the blood of Christ. Leviticus 17:11 says that the life of the flesh is in the blood, and when the blood is shed, the flesh is dead. So the cup represents the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. In a moment, we're going to take the bread and we're going to take the cup and participate together. So gather whatever you have. The elements themselves are not important. It's the symbolism of the elements that matter. I have some crackers. I have a cup of juice. You gather what you need. But before we do that, let me pray. Father, we thank you this morning for what Jesus Christ accomplished on our behalf. We thank you for who we are in Jesus Christ. We thank you that you love us and you continue to provide for us. And you promise us through the Holy Spirit that all of your promises are true and that we will someday enjoy all that you have to offer us. So this morning, in this moment, a sacred moment, we remember who you are, who Jesus is, and what you, through your love and Christ's work, has done for us. Amen. So take your bread. And the scriptures say, tell us that Jesus took the bread and after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Eat it in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. Then he took the cup and he said, drink it, drink ye all of it in remembrance of me. Jesus, we thank you today for your love for your mercy, for your grace, and all that we have because of what you have done for us. 
Amen. Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever bring We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever bring, we live for you. song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever bring Live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. build our life on your firm foundation. So God, we come before you declaring that we will do that. We will build our life on your love and your promise.
great day to worship together, to learn from the book of Ephesians, all that God says about who we are, loved, adopted, redeemed, to celebrate the Lord's Supper together and remember that Jesus died to forgive us from our sins. And I know all of us are longing for connection. And we see you, we know you, we know the people that are watching right now. Some of you are not connected at Faith Church. I know some of you are. You're in a small group or you're in an ABF or you're in a care ministry group. But I'm talking to those of you out there that are not connected at all and you're longing for engagement. We want to connect with you. And so next Sunday, May 10th, we're starting something new here at Faith Church. We're starting Sunday discussion groups, opportunities right for you at 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock on Sunday morning for you to get into a conversation, super casual, low pressure conversation on a Zoom call where you can talk about the things that are going on and you're learning from the sermon. So Pastor Brad talking today about how we're adopted into the family of God. Imagine leaving this sermon and going right into a conversation with some other people on our staff and other people from the Valley to talk about what it means to be adopted. If you want to engage and be a part of a Sunday discussion group, visit faithchurchlv.com this week and sign up. Super low pressure. We're just looking for ways for you to engage and go deeper. I hope this week rocks for you. Thanks so much for being with us. Love you all.